Tonight on our century, Aussie brain power that'll make you feel proud. Homegrown ingenious ideas that make our world a better place. From hanging out the clothes and the kids, to checking out the safety of unborn babies. A gun whose performance is in a class entirely of its own. Or saving our country with weapons of war. You can say for yourselves the guns are all right, but we made them for killing Japs. We invented the safest way to get out of an aeroplane. And how not to get into space, but at least we had a go. Many professors have asked me, how many tens of thousands of symbols have you invented? And I say, only 50. From the earliest times, Australians have been a pretty inventive mob, especially in fields like aviation. Lawrence Hargraves was playing around with kites and flying machines long before the Wright brothers. In more recent times, Australian inventions like the Interscan landing system, the inflatable escape slide, and this one here, the black box flight recorder, have been in use right across the world. Now, it's called the black box, even though it's painted orange. A Melbourne bloke named Dave Warren invented this in 1954. He thought that if every plane carried a box that recorded what the instruments and the cockpit crew said just before a crash, then we might be able to prevent a lot of accidents. And he was right. Now, Dave's invention was just one of a long list of clever Aussie ideas. What's your idea of weekend relaxation? Ah, is it this? Or do you prefer this? Well, no matter how your fancy runs, one thing is certain, you'll have far more time for it if you own a Victor. Now, you can't get any more practical than this. It's good old Aussie ingenuity in action. The Victor lawnmower. Every backyard had a lawn of sorts, which meant that every bloke had to push a lawnmower. We knew that there were much better things to do with the weekend. To the rescue came Mervyn Victor Richardson with his rotary petrol lawnmower, the old Victor motor mower. Now we're all together, let's turn grass into lawn the easy Victor way. Merv knew exactly what Australia needed to conquer the backyard. The first model in 1952 wasn't flash. An old peach can for a petrol tank and billy cart wheels. But that didn't matter. The victor would be victorious. Merv's ingenious two-stroke marvel made him almost an overnight millionaire. But the fact is, he wasn't the inventor of the petrol lawnmower. What Merv did was improve the existing design of an engineering friend. Merv's genius was that he also knew how to sell it. Now remember, there had been other inventors playing around with fancy lawnmowers. Mr. Cyril Thomas reckoned he'd earned a spell. Cyril Thomas thought that he had the answer with his electric mower. He used the motor out of his wife's sewing machine and believed his back brakes were over. But it never took off. If history had been different, today we might be turning grass into lawn with a Cyril. It's a dream, this new easy wind-up action. Along with the victor came that other Aussie backyard icon, the Hills Hoist. Lance Hill was an Adelaide man who launched this garden gizmo onto the world in the late 40s. But like Merv and his victor, Lance had also picked up someone else's bright idea. The famous hoist had been patented by a Melbourne blacksmith, a bloke named Gilbert Toyne, back in the 1920s. But Mr Hill was Johnny on the spot. He'd come along at the start of Australia's baby boom, as backyards began to spread. He tinkered with the old design, improved it here and there, and got down to business. 
Lance Hill knew that every Australian needed a Hills hoist. But what Lance needed were metal tubes to build his newfangled clothesline. Remember, this was right after the war and you couldn't get spare parts. But the ever resourceful Mr Hill found the answer under Sydney Harbour. Their pipes had been used for a boom net to block Japanese subs and they were now up for sale. It was Australia's answer to flagpoles, washing fluttered proudly from Hill's hoists right across the nation. There was always something hanging off them. <laughs> A free body massage, but you had to go to the beach and almost drown to get one. From the start of our century, Australians were into the sun and the surf, but first, you had to survive. The fact is, when public bathing first took off, many Aussies jumped in over their heads, literally. Local drownings were so common that in 1906, we invented the volunteer lifesavers. But that didn't fix the problem. Dragging people out of the surf was so dangerous too many lifesavers were going down for the third time. So a bloke with the unfortunate name of Lister Ormsby came up with a brainwave. It was the Australian life-saving belt, a harness attached to a giant reel with a rope and a handle. Belted up, the lifesaver could safely go to the rescue, knowing that no matter what the surf was like, he and the swimmer in trouble could be winched back to the beach. Believe it or not, at Bondi Beach in 1907, the first person to be rescued this way was a young bloke called Charlie Smith. Smithy makes it again, this time facing the heaviest odds that have been against him. Young Charlie would survive to become Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, thanks to the Aussie life-saving ring. Penicillin, one of the great antibiotics of the 20th century. But when it came to saving lives, a Nobel Prize winner Howard Florey can hardly be matched. He may be the Australian of the century. In the 1930s, Florey led a research team at Oxford University that came up with penicillin, a medical breakthrough that saved over 50 million lives. And every day, when pregnant women around the world have an ultrasound to check their baby during pregnancy, they're enjoying another Australian invention. The marvellous bionic ear, the cochlear implant, was also the result of outstanding local research. This homegrown invention lets the profoundly deaf tune in the wonderful world of sound. Childless couples can now take heart with the IVF program, thanks to Australian scientists. And the Aussie pacemaker will kickstart any heart. Australian researchers have led the world in so many medical miracles. But there have been times when even the experts couldn't quite agree. John Harris, National President of the Variety Clubs of America, presents to Sister Elizabeth Kenny the annual Humanitarian Award. And she is honoured as the 10th annual campaign against infantile paralysis is launched. Sister Elizabeth Kenny was one of the most loved and controversial characters of her time. In the 1930s, she split the medical world with her treatment for polio, or infant paralysis, as it was known. Through the first half of the century, polio hit Australia, and mostly targeting children. Polio could kill, but most times it left children paralysed in the legs. From the 30s to the 50s, the sight of kids in calipers was a constant reminder of this epidemic. Every parent's nightmare. Most doctors believed the best treatment was splints. The affected limbs were immobilised and the children were told to simply lie there, sometimes for years. It was enough to break your heart. But Elizabeth Kenny thought that splints were barbaric. Instead, she used a mixture of massage, 
exercise and heat. It was a formula that she'd worked out for herself during her days as a bush nurse before World War I. Back then, polio was so new that doctors didn't even have a name for it. In the 1920s and 30s, Australians flocked to Sister Kenny's clinics. Many believe she was a miracle worker. But to the medical board, it was all hocus pocus. Sister Kenny's work was dismissed as a fraud. And finally in 1938, when a Royal Commission found against her, Elizabeth Kenny quit Australia in disgust. But it would be very different in the United States. There her treatment was widely accepted. Sister Kenny clinics would become national landmarks. She would rub shoulders with movie stars and even meet the country's most famous polio victim, President Franklin Roosevelt. In 1946, when Hollywood made a movie of her life and her struggle, 20,000 people jammed Times Square just to catch a glimpse of the famous nurse from Queensland. Yet back home, all this fame counted for nothing. I am rather sorry that my work hasn't, was not here before. But I did when she returned in 1950, Sister Kenny had to admit that as far as her treatment was concerned here, the door was firmly closed. Sister Kenny died two years later, leaving an argument over her treatment that still rages today. It's 1916, the Great War is on, men and boys join up. Back home, even the boot boy has signed up to do his bit. A couple of young fellas see a chance for some extra cash. If only they can persuade the boss that they're up to it. Now it's not an old movie, it's an early commercial for that great Aussie invention, Kiwi boot polish. By the time they made this old film, they had the money to pay for it. Ten years after its launch in Melbourne in 1906, Kiwi had taken the boot world by storm. They'd sold no less than 30 million tins of the nifty nugget polish. Throughout World War I, Australian, British and American foot soldiers were devoted to it. Because despite tradition, spit and polish and elbow grease just wasn't enough. Kiwi's great claim to fame was that it could restore colour to faded boots, as well as waterproofing, cleaning and preserving the leather. It was called Kiwi for the very good reason that the inventor William Ramsey named it after his wife, who was, yep, a New Zealander. History's greatest invasion, D-Day, June 6th, 1944. Some new ideas have come from old customs. 135,000 troops crossed the notoriously rough English Channel to hit the beaches of Normandy. It was one of the most important missions of World War II. Now, D-Day was not a good day to get seasick. The solution was a world away. For generations, Aborigines had used the leaves of the corkwood tree to drug fish in billabongs so that they'd float to the surface. Australia's wartime scientists found that the leaves contained a chemical called Hyacin, which also stops seasickness. The new drug was so important for D-Day that it was actually flown to Britain in the middle of the war. It was then given to every soldier as they headed off to Normandy. Meanwhile, out in the Pacific War, every digger wanted to be handed one of these. The Owen gun was possibly the greatest Australian invention of the Second World War. It was prized by our boys in Papua New Guinea because it kept on firing anywhere. Wet or dry, clean or dirty, it didn't matter. It just kept on going. Evelyn Owen, a young bloke from Wollongong, had invented this revolutionary simple gun. What was tricky was getting the army brass to buy it. In fact, Owen ran out of patience with Canberra. He enlisted and went off to fight the Japanese himself. A 
as luck would have it, he left the gun with a local engineering company. And somehow, they convinced the Minister for Defence that it was exactly what the diggers needed. You can see for yourselves the guns are all right, but we made them for killing Japs. I'm quite sure the AIS will be satisfied with them. Some say that the Owen gun was the greatest morale booster the Australian Army ever had. Grateful soldiers call it the digger's darling. And we kept using it until the Vietnam War. Thanks, Mr. Owen. That's what the boys have been waiting for. The finest submachine gun in the world. But Evelyn Owen was an inventor and not a businessman. He never took out a patent on his design, so he didn't make a penny from his remarkable gun. But this bloke was different. John Pomeroy was quick to take out a patent when he invented the world's first exploding bullet, way back in 1902. And when the British adopted it to shoot down German Zeppelins during their bombing raids in World War I, Pomeroy collected 25,000 pounds in royalties. And back then, that was a fortune. Pomeroy was actually a Kiwi, but he had the good sense to move to Melbourne, and so we now claim him as one of ours. Life in the lab can be a lonely occupation. But if you want the world to pick up your bright idea, you must have passion and perseverance. Many professors have asked me, how many tens of thousands of symbols have you invented? And they say, only 50. And they're only pictorial little pictures. And with these symbols, I combine them to thousands upon thousands of meanings. And here are the most simple ones. The mouse. The eye, the ear, the nose. Nose and mouse means taste. Charles Bliss was definitely a man with a mission and a different kind of inventor. A concentration camp prisoner during World War II, he believed that much of the trouble he'd seen in his native Europe came from a misunderstanding of language. So when Charles came to settle in Australia in 1946, he gave up his career as a chemical engineer and he devoted himself to the creation of his universal language. He slogged away year after year with more ridicule than recognition. Finally, Charles cashed in his life savings and borrowed from friends to make his invention public. The sun shines, the moon shines, the star shines or twinkles. Mr. Bliss's wife, Claire, was given the job of explaining her husband's magnificent obsession to the rest of the world. And then Claire wrote over 6,000 letters to 6,000 educators in the whole world. No answer. Only a few, a blessed few, like Bertrand Russell and Julian Huxley, these few great men acknowledged the value of my work. They gave me the courage to carry on. The breakthrough finally came in the late 60s, after 20 years of tireless work. Mr. Bliss received a special invitation to the Toronto Centre for Disabled Children in Canada. Children who had never been able to communicate were using Bliss's symbols to reach other human beings for the very first time. So what are you going to do tonight? Tell me. You'd like a, a letter? Mm. And what would you do with the letter if you had it, Carrie? Uh-huh. You'd give it. You'd give it to Mom and Dad. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bliss, from the little children students of Samantha. And then I was so happy there, and I they played my mandolin and told them jokes and old tricks and juggled before them, and they laughed and laughed and laughed their head off. Charles Bliss died in 1985, but his universal symbols live on in 33 countries amongst people who normally speak 17 different languages, and today they speak as one. Well, Charles Bliss and others tonight have shown that with most good ideas or inventions, you have to back them up with plenty of perseverance and a lot of luck. Too often in our century, good Australian brainwaves have gone offshore, giving fortunes and factories to someone else. Like this remarkable black box flight recorder. Now, believe it or not, this invention was rejected. 
It was rejected by the Australian Department of Civil Aviation and by the RAAF. So guess what happened? It was picked up and sold around the world by British and American companies. Just one in a long green and gold line of good ideas that flew the coop. the memories and images of the past 100 years, be sure to get your copy of the Our Century book, available wherever good books are sold. Andy relaxes to demonstrate the self-emptying ashtray. Simply flick the ash into the tray and it falls...